Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the second event in the Hyde Lecture Series. I'm Mark Hinchman, professor in interior design. And I can tell you that when the interior design faculty, so myself, Nate, and Lindsay, this is before Mi Young joined us, when we were uh, tossing around some names, trying to figure out people that we'd want to invite, one person who was on the top of all three of our lists was today's speaker. And the reason for that is that Lindsay has used her writings in her class, which I think some of you are in right now, the intro to design class. And Nate has used uh, writing from uh, Sashi Khan's seminal book, Rethinking Design and Interiors. Uh, he likes the second chapter particularly. And I have quoted her recently in the introduction to a book on interior design that I'm writing. And the reason we all came to really think so highly of her, and we're actually talking about her, her words more than her projects, although you will see some of her projects. But what she is really unusually good at doing is summing up the state of affairs of interior design. And I, I don't want to say interior design is in some state of crisis because it really isn't, and it's not for those of us who are in it. The crisis is more the difficulty of explaining the profession to those who aren't so knowledgeable of it. And that's where all three of us have found that using Ms. Khan's work has been very, very helpful for us. She has a, an unusual quality of being able to make generalizations that are really useful to outsiders while staying true to specific information. And she can simplify things down to a, a sound bite without losing the intellectual rigor that we all like to associate with the design fields. So to sum it up, she really seems to have her fingers on the pulse of contemporary interior design. So you might be wondering, well, what is it about her that has led her to have such a adaptability to do this. Well, we can start with geography. She is born in India, studied in Scotland at the University of Edinburgh, where she got a Bachelor of Fine Arts, but the bulk of her career has played out in New York City. So she, to jump into her resume, she moves to New York, she starts out working at Swanky Hayden Connell, and then she becomes a senior designer at Gensler. She gets two master's degrees, so this is really showing the, the breadth of her disciplinary experience, two master's degrees in architecture and interior design, and then SOM lures her away, and she is its director of design, and for the period of one year, she overlaps with Margot Grant Walsh, who is one of the great figures of 20th century interior design. So 9-11, for anybody living in New York, was an extremely traumatic uh, event. In the year after 9-11, for reasons both related and unrelated to that, uh, Sashi Khan leaves SOM and starts her own firm, The Collective, and it's the collective is still the firm that she's the principal of, and they have offices in New York and in Edinburgh. I, I really don't know how this fits in, how she accomplished all this stuff, but somewhere along in this time, she is the chair of the interiors program at Parsons, and it's because of that activity that one of the accolades that comes her way is Educator of the Year, and that's from IFMA. That's the, the big facilities management group. Contract Magazine named her Designer of the Year and of the awards and titles that she's gotten, my favorite of the bunch, is that she is Fellow of the RSA, the Royal Society for the Encouragement of the Arts, Manufacturers, and Commerce. She served two terms as president of IFI, that's the, the principal international interior design organization, International Federation of Interior Architects and Designers, and it was actually at an IFI event that I first ran into her personally. 
one of her accomplishments at the ISI, and it's a big one, was crafting this declaration. And I, I really encourage all of you to go to the IFI website. You'll find the declaration on there, and it, it's only about a, um, a page long. But it's one of these statements that, going back to what I earlier said, does a remarkable job of summing up what is interior design now, what are the big challenges, what defines it as a profession, and what is it going to be going on in the future? So I, I won't read the entire thing, but I will just read two sentences from it that I've selected. One more for the functional view and one more for the poetic aspect of it. So this is from the IFI Declaration. Theoretical, applied, and innate knowledge are fundamental to the practice of interior design. And skillfully designed spaces can arouse in us a sense of purpose or a sense of the profound. Uh, Sashi Khan shared with me last night that the lecture that she's about to give, she has not given before. So this is a, a world premiere we are about to witness. Uh, I'm sure we are going to get into the profound. It has this provocative title that you can see there. So please join me in welcoming Sashi Khan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mark. That was uh, that was great. Um, this is a new lecture. I have not given it before. It's a new set of thoughts, which I hope that um, in part talking about with you here will help to evolve my own thinking. In part, perhaps you will have comments that will allow um, us collectively to take this further. But I have to start by saying it's just such an honor and a pleasure to be here with you on your really beautiful campus for this amazing day today all the monarchs flying around, and, and I was privileged to spend time with students uh, from interior design who were just wonderful, Rachel and Seth and several people. It was um, really, really great. Thank you for your time and your very warm welcome. Um, so I want to just share ideas and thoughts. I always think, you know, Mark made a comment that kind of was a little bit of a needle for me because, um, you want, to, you want to do good work. You want to do work that is meaningful and you want to, I want to, I speak in generalities here, but, but um, we all want to do work that makes an impact, that helps people, that evolves. That's the baseline for us. It's a baseline for me personally. Moving to New York was never about fortune and, fortune and fame or, being the superstar designer, because ultimately some of that work um, doesn't necessarily feed people's souls in the way that something more mundane does and can. And so part of my personal life's path has been exploring what is it about that ordinary everyday happenstance, that little experience that happens, is it just the perfection of many factors coming together? Or is there criteria there that we can use, we can learn, we can articulate and use to intentionally design and inform or inform our thinking and design our work? So we are in the process of an introspection in our own practice. And we're distilling some of these kinds of thoughts and we hope that the work we do in the next decade or two will be different. Um, we hope it will be more appropriate. We hope it will be really outstandingly unusual or different enough that it will be in the category of not just words, but it will speak volumes in a different way. But this is where we want to head, head, head to. So we're thinking in our own practice issues of beauty, justice, truth, these are not easy issues. They're certainly philosophical. Um, just, I'm not really going to focus on our firm's work. I do want to share with you though what we do do and we try to walk the talk. And what we do is a very broad cross section of work. And, and we, um, 
multidisciplinary, we're a very academic studio, we do a lot of research. And we do everything from strategies to the, the scenario planning that gives um, workplace design or corporate office work to uh, the retail, hospitality. We recently got into education, designing uh, campus buildings. Um, I have two business partners who started the collective with me. And one of them teaches at Columbia University, has taught, has a PhD in historic preservation and teaches um, historic Columbia architecture for like 40 years. And uh, he is our restoration and preservation expert, expert. So history, theory, culture, in that sense, the past informs our work a lot. And uh, we care deeply about people. We care deeply about working together and collaborating and giving everybody adequate or everybody due credit. So you'll notice it's called the SC Collective. That was a business um, reason to do that. We're really just the collective. And this is one of the things that we will change and evolve in this next year, a few months. Um, so I'm going to go on to the next. It's a, it's a little animation that shows a broad cross section of our work. Um, and, and it explains our ethos. Sorry, this is sound. Oh, I don't know how to do it. Good. Good. Thank you. Our environments are the repositories of our memories and the containers of our dreams, aspirations, and needs. They tell our stories. They're reflections of us, our society, our culture, and our time. Deep down, we know that architecture lives and dies by its quality of space, the being there. The object, a building, contains and conditions that space, but the space is what we experience. This is not simple, because the human psyche is not simple. And it's a strange old psyche that a space must fit, soothe, intrigue, enchant, and enrich. And not only within, for a building also creates exterior space, vis-a-vis -vis the street, which must be similarly fashioned. So architecture becomes a critical living interface between without and within, between private and public, between nature and culture. It must delineate and safeguard both while providing life-giving connections. So design, coming back to where we are today, is everywhere. Everything is designed. There is nothing we do that is not designed today. And everyone's a designer. Is that too loud? No? Everything from this bottle to any single thing. 
Well, that's a lot of opportunity for us. That's fantastic. What I love most of all knowing is that there are many governments around the world that have made it a mandate to grow their economies, their national economies through and by design, which unleashes the world for us. And it unleashes the world in a world that is, is, is a bit challenging. Perhaps not for you guys. Um, maybe it's all really exciting. For, for us, it's really challenging to very quickly be on top of all the issues that we want to address, that we want to resolve. In a, in a world that looks at trends that are here today, gone tomorrow. So because of some of that kind of trending, we don't, we're not a trendy firm. We don't like to think about new trends, but we do keep a finger on the pulse of the very large trends that are taking place. And we keep a finger on the pulse of current affairs. And there are some things that are changing so much that are here to stay that will really impact us. And they will, they will affect your lives, they affect all of our lives, but certainly how you do what you do into the future is, is going to be impacted by this. And one of them is the fact that our population is um, expected to double. I think by the end of the century, it's expected to completely double. We're at 7.5 billion people in the world today. And, and you, you travel, you see what the world is like. And as you see from this chart, it's only in the last 200 years that we have had exponential growth in the world's population. And then there are other facts that I know you know um, even more current information or you have more current information than I do, which is that by 2050, um, half of the population or the, the population that is 65 and older will double. So that's really interesting. That means thinking about our opportunities for design. If we care about designing for people, if we care about those core values that are really centered in being human, then, then that's an interesting factor to have to think about. And for all you cool young kids, you know what, you're all going to get there as well. We're all getting older every day. And, and it's, a, it's a challenge. What are we looking at? What are we thinking about? How do we do this? Um, other factors, there is a massive increase in urbanization. People are going back into cities. This is actually being driven a lot by the, your generation, the younger generations, Gen, Gen X, Gen Y, um, certainly the millennials who don't want to travel, you don't want to have um, drive long distances, want to, have, uh, want to be able to walk everywhere, save the environment, M many, many factors. But so great opportunity to revitalize our interior, our inner cities. And um, cumulatively, here are some of the, in a nutshell, some of our challenges and our opportunities. People are living longer. That means we have to think about everything about living longer for ourselves as well. Our systems, our processes, our infrastructure, our spaces, um, our, our place making, our wayfinding, you name it. People are moving around an awful lot. I am, I am actually a very common example today of moving across the world. So population migration, whether it's within our country or whether it's across the world is, is very, very um, severe and, and on the rise. Cross-generational culture is, is a big one to think about. We're not designing for one kind of group, we're designing for multi uh, different kinds of issues and groups which gives us issues of density. So if everybody moves into the inner city, now it's very dense. New York City, of course, as you know, is one of the most sustainable cities, in part because it is remarkably dense. Um, we have to deal with diversity. We don't like dealing with diversity. Apparently, in our current cultural climate, in many places around the world, we, we want to be more nationalistic. We don't want diversity. And yet, that's here to stay. We're not changing that too much, I don't think. 
Um, and even if we do change it, we still have to understand how to design for diversity. So that all, of course, plays a role on our natural resources, diminishing resources, needing to be imaginative, needing to be more responsible, thinking about how we do what we do, huge opportunities, but uh, social challenges that are bigger than perhaps any other generation in time. This is the biggest challenge of all. We are at a pivot point in history. Humanity will change more in the next 20 years than in the 300 years before. Technology is now the defining factor of our society. We will be able to travel virtually to the most amazing places directly from our living room or using our mobile devices. Billions of devices and objects will be connected in the Internet of Things. Soon technology is moving inside of us, becoming a part of us. Our contact lenses will be connected to the Internet and nanobots will be in our bloodstreams fixing our cholesterol. Life will be magical, abundant, full of possibilities. What could be better? Because we know, don't we, that what makes us human will never change. By 2027, computers are likely to match the capacity of the human brain, perhaps even reach some kind of awareness or emotional intelligence. Yes, artificial intelligence and cognitive computing are incredibly powerful. But if we fail to consider the unintended consequences, such as, for example, an intelligence explosion, these advances could be more dangerous than nuclear weapons. Why would we expect robots or artificial intelligence to share or even understand human values, ethics, and emotions? Technology doesn't have ethics, but the future of humanity depends on it. We need to spend just as much time on the norms and the values and the context than we spend on technology itself. After all, the future is not just something that happens to us. The future is something that we create. Some images of a future that, that are being imagined in part to solve some of these issues. Meta structures, mega structures, they're being called by different names. Um, large, large structures that allow us to be more efficient with our natural resources, our power, our um, space, air quality. And these are remarkably different. What's being conceived is unlike anything that we have seen before. So you're looking at here the tallest building in the world, the Burj Khalifa, that was built by SOM in Dubai. And this is the size of it. That's the tallest building in the world today. And by comparison, it's, it, it's, uh, it tells its own story, but story that's really more important that, that it doesn't yet tell in these images is that unlike these towers, that we have in all of our cities, which are stratified with functions that are retail at the bottom, office perhaps, or hotel and residence. These cities are literally neighborhoods. They have their own simulated skies, and, and they have hospitals and transportation systems and lakes and parks and everything. Uh, so these are, these are kind of extraordinary. You're looking at, I'm, sure, I'm going to show just very quickly two or three images. This is a, an old one. This is one of the earlier meta structures that was considered one of the earliest, still not built because we're still inventing the polycarbons that are needed to be able to have these structures be realized. But this and the Shimizu Bay Tower Pyramid, if built, when built, will house 750,000 people under one roof. And this is one node. So when you look at that single node, that's what we're looking at. So it's conceiving life in a completely different kind of way. Is this what we want? How would we conceive it? How would you want to live? This tower, the Crystal Island Tower by Norman Foster, was actually came very close to being built. It was in, in Moscow, and it 
was stopped because of the financial crisis, but, but it is an example of the pyramid that you just saw. And um, these things are real. They haven't really happened yet, but they will, and they're imminently happening. Increasingly, more and more of these are being designed. This is a cover of Time magazine from last summer, and it talks about all kinds of connectedness, and some of it we're really delighted with because it makes our life so easy. I can press a button on my phone, and it puts, it puts the oven on, my food is cooked, the lights are on, the mood, mood lighting is fixed, the music goes on. Um, I can have my fridge, these things all exist today. This is old news. But I don't want to talk about old news, I want to talk about the consequence of the, these kinds of developments. So, if my food can be ordered very simply, how does it arrive? How long does it sit somewhere? Where does it sit? Is it cooled? Is it not cooled? Is, it, is there a holding place for it? Are we designing environments that contain these holding places? What is the process of that? Um, who manages that? Are we thinking about this? Is this part of your day-to-day -day consideration when you design a project? We're just beginning to think about it in our office. Many, many, it's happening in every single aspect of our life. So we have, today we do have mirrors and toilets. You know, you can urinate and they report pH, everything goes back to your doctors, that exists. But, but what about the full process of that? And what are the implications of that? Who is involved with it? What kind of environments are needed? Are they small? Are they big? Are they technological? And this is a frontier of design, and who's thinking about that? This looks very cozy and really fantastic, but what about the implications of exercise and good nutrition and being healthy and movement? I saw some really nice um, equipment that you have. Very, was very impressed with your facilities. Love that you're both analog and digital. I thought I was a dying breed. I thought my generation is the last and felt very privileged, felt very special that we are the generation that will be both analog and digital. And there's a wonderful overview that being analog provides. Um, and, and I was actually very impressed, surprised, a little impressed to see that you have in the school, in your school of architecture and design, the, um, um, a process that continues to advocate for that. I, I, I think it's so essential, so kudos to you. But we know that the implication of that is mammoth. We know that, that there is a meta industry out there that is being spawned because of the 3D printing in every aspect. So if this was what we thought was design or things like this, we haven't seen what it's going to begin to do. Are we prepared? Are you prepared? Cars are these, this was, a, we worked with, it, with Tecmer, who was one of the companies that gave the first 3D printed car. Um, this was running around in Chicago 2014. And in a short uh, the two and a half years, we are talking about autonomous vehicles being very rampant out there. I wanted to include a news clip that I didn't know how to embed into, into the computer last night. Uh, which was actually a follow-up on Gerd's um, animation. But this is a current conversation about what happens when automation takes over so much or artificial intelligence takes over. So you had in this, it was a news reel. It was a news um, release where they had two truck drivers or two trucks, two massive big lorries. One about to overtake the other, one without a driver and the other one with a human being driving. That's real, that's just about to happen, um, but then what does it do to our world? Or, or this, um, a 10-story structure that is printed in, in just hours and costs $5,000. What does it do to our art? What does it do to our work? What kind of buildings will you design? How are you thinking about incorporating this technology in that speed and how, 
what are we going to do? Um, and then, of course, when that happens, we all want to go, or at least I want to go away, take a break, and go sit under some tree or on the beach and just, just, just feel my pulse and say, oh my gosh, I, I better just experience this nature and this life. And um, so from the Interiors Decla Declaration, what uh, Mark just read out, um, I'll add a little bit more to that. Uh, what, what actually inspired us to rethink our own process, we're 13 years old in uh, at the collective. One, we want to um, modify our brand and truly go back to the honesty of being called the collective and not, and not SC, but also then addressing beauty and meaning and, and the heart and the spirit. But what does that mean? So what does it mean? English is not my first language. I always go back to the dictionary to really think about what it means. And I don't know what it means. I know that, that this thing of that it's in the eye of the beholder, uh, I must say I'm going to be a, probably a little provocative, but I feel like saying, you know what, it's a bit of a cop out. It's like saying, well, any beauty goes, and does it though, does it? Does it really? What are, what are the qualities that deeply touch and inspire, inspire us? And are they in the eye of the beholder? Or is it something really intrinsic that we can, if we were, if we were careful enough, thoughtful enough, um, that we could put our finger on that pulse? Because the truth is, with this advent of technology, we better understand this stuff differently to all those thousands of years of philosophical thinking. What about justice? We have a lot of conversation about justice in our own country right now. And I'm not trying to be political, but surely, as thoughtful individuals, what does it mean to be just? What does it mean for us as designers who are by our intrinsic nature, forward thinking and open-minded? How do we design fairly? impartially, with integrity, for human beings, regardless of what they look like or who they are. And what about truth? What about truth in our work? So, so I was really thinking about this, that we thought, you know what, we're not, we're not, it's not good enough to say these things, but we're not walking our own talk, and that's partly why we're rethinking all our processes and we want to walk our talk, and we want to be integrity with being the collective. The reason we weren't called the collective was that when we incorporated, there was a firm, uh, an internet company that was called the collective that existed. We couldn't buy the name. And at the time, we didn't, we needed to do it fairly quickly, and we should have thought of a different name. We didn't, we wanted to be the collective. We think it takes a village to design and build anything. And so our, our office is structured around the film industry model, and, and we think it's really important to give due credit to everybody involved, and not just the principles of the firm, which was what was happening at, at SOM when I was there. So, so this, is, this is what we're doing. And Another little uh, quip from, so the declaration was important. IFI is the world body for interior, it's an association, it's, it's like the UIA for architecture. Uh, IFI is the equivalent of that for interiors. And this declaration came about during my presidency. We worked really hard to get everybody together and get intelligence and a uh, 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 unified understanding and so it was input from 88 countries. And um, I was very, very proud of some of the things that came out of that. And so in, we incorporate that as much as we can in our work. This is the declaration that Mark mentioned. It really only talks to core values of any discipline. It's not just we use these words, you know, what is the value, the relevance, responsibility, the culture, the knowledge, the business and, and the identity of this discipline we call interior design or interior architecture. Same could be said for anything. So having done that three years ago, we're doing the same back to basics for our firm and this is the process that we're looking at. So we are 
thinking, we are reconceptualizing, we are redeveloping to manifest a new kind of a possibility. And um, we have been all about collaborating um, within our industry, within our community, and interdisciplinarily within our firm. But we've taken that a step further. We want to do this globally. We think that it's really important that, um, that the issue of being global does not, well, it can't disappear just because of the internet of things, as we've heard, and because of the migration, which is a major, major um, trend and is not disappearing fast. And so, so then if it doesn't disappear, then how do we reconnect it back to the values that we want to grow up with? And so what we have done is start this. Um, as as, a, as a, in tandem with the collective, we've started something else we call Globally Redesign. It's a little more direct. And it is designing globally. And I want to show you a quick little project. It is a very... Um, it's somewhat modest. This is what Glow Design is all about. Um, global uh, uh, collaborative initiative. It addresses all aspects of the process within our culture. So it addresses the making of things, craftsmanship, the past, sort of from the William Morris, um, the arts and crafts movement to what we need to be doing. Uh, today with the maker culture, um, into rethinking education, into thinking about emerging design and emerging designers, and um, all the various aspects that go into that, and sort of in a linear process, um, really staying focused on creativity and, um, and design, thinking about uh, how to integrate philosophy, uh, theory into the making and shape a new kind of a new kind of um, visual or a new kind of aesthetic. So this is the full process. It's a pretty closed loop process, straightforward. To do this, so we just this is a little test. We did it very quickly. I'm going to show you just a three month project, which is like a class project uh, would be for you in school. And um, we did this with a very small team. It is a multidisciplinary, doesn't look it, but it is. So Gianluca Bernizzi, this gentleman is an artist. He lives in Bangkok, he is Italian, um, is, is also a business entrepreneur, multidisciplinary. Um, Eric has, is, a, is an incredible intellect. Um, MIT, Oxford, um, a, a PhD out of Oxford, a MIT master's in architecture and from Cornell, lives, is American, um, obviously lived in the UK, but now is married to a Chinese girl, lives in Hong Kong for the last 10 years. Michael Thompson lives in London, but travels the world. Um, and there, there I am, funky picture. Um, Juicy is a really interesting individual. He is a uh, uh, is, a, is a technology expert in the digital world. He is from um, north of Finland, but lives in Berlin, is married to a Chinese, travels the world. We met up for a weekend at one of the oldest homes in Scotland. It was fantastic. And we um, brainstormed a little bit of the process. We, we, we were discussing all these issues I've just shared with you. Going back to basics, thinking about humanity, thinking about what it takes to be designing for the future, thinking about how do we do this? How do we do it together? What are ideas about and how do we manifest them and how do we do it across the world? Because it seems that even today, we are not all that good at collaborating. There are too many challenges in the process and so we wanted to challenge ourselves to see if we could actually make something work. And so a process that we all use, this is nothing, this is very low tech. We had very grand ideas for all kinds of technological and real time and this and that. And in the end, of course, 
we didn't have, we needed to make resources and we were five, and we were in um, three continents and the challenges were actually kind of immense and so we came up with this little project called Hammers and Nails. And Hammers and Nails is a metaphor, just an installation. It also started out as a massive big installation that would be at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. We love the play on words of design always being at that sort of edgy and at the cutting edge. But there is a festival, the oldest one in the, in the world that celebrates 70th anniversary. That's a very open festival, um, uncensored, and it takes place in the city of Edinburgh. And so we did launch this at the, at the Fringe. And um, the installation, looked at the art of making and, and we thought, you know what, we want to break to make. And um, I don't really want to go into sort of the idea is pretty self-explanatory, uh, but of course just going through the, the normal, typical process. Um, we had to find sponsors with the installation finally looking at it, testing it, seeing what size do those nails need to be, how do we hammer something, how do we break something. And the project became basically this. We have nails. We started out with a, with a technological interface, um, but we changed that. We have a grid work of pre-drilled holes that you would hammer into. On the opposite side of it, we have a mirror. So here you have the tools, the ancient tool and the grid work of, of, um, of uh, holes with the nails that were pre-cut, certain size. On the other side, a piece of glass mirror that you could see yourself, it reflects back at us where we are now, the word design stenciled. And we had a panel discussion and a little event and we asked people to basically hammer nails and, and they broke the word and that was all, that, that was what we did. And it was pretty great. So, so it launched for us this sort of a new kind of a beginning. And, and a new beginning in part because our questions are too profound for this time in place. And I, and I had this conversation just a little bit earlier with, with Kathy, which is that I'm very aware that if I, I live in Manhattan, that if I take a plastic bag of rubbish, my leftovers, and I tie that plastic bag, and I dump it in the Hudson River, that through the water, waterways, it, it shows up in Shanghai, and that's a fact. So if that is happening, and then how do we all come together to really look at our processes in order to rethink our processes so that we can make some shifts and changes in order to make something radically different? Well, that's the absolute beauty of being in the academy. That's kind of the, the privilege of being in your world and, and the privilege of being able to dream and to think in the most broad and the most conceptual ways and um, imagine what we can do when, when we do it together and we bring minds together. So, so then just to summarize, designing regardless of whether it's two-dimensional, three-dimensional um, design provides solutions that's important, it's a creative act, but it's bigger than I am. Um, design provides hope. Certainly for me personally, the next generation is the hope. The next project is the hope. Um, and the next opportunity is the hope, because with that, we have a possibility to do something different, something fresh. That also is our future. And I want to finish with, you heard this. Um, this, and I do want to read it again because I think it's really profound. And I am quoting Elizabeth Farley, who is a very well-known journalist in Australia. And when she wrote this, she was actually critiquing a new Frank Gehry project that had just been built. 
And um, I won't tell you what her critique of the project was, but, but I was impressed that she wrote these words, that deep down we know that architecture lives or dies by its quality of space, the being there. The object, a building, contains and conditions that space, but the space is what we experience. This is not simple because the human psyche is not simple and it's a strange old psyche that a space must fit, soothe, intrigue, enchant, and enrich. And not only within, for a building also creates exterior space via the street, which must be similarly fashioned. So architecture becomes a critical living interface between without and within, between private and public, between nature and culture, it must delineate and safeguard both while providing life-giving connection. Thank you. Okay, so now we have time for questions. And raise your hand and I'll bring you the microphone. Hello. Uh, so I'm Ali, I'm a second year student of architecture. I have a question about, uh, you said that there is that design can change the mood of people. I'm from um, Middle East, from Iraq. <laughs> so it's a pretty exciting place. As you know, a lot of wars. So can design change the mood of people through all that time of wars and, and sadness? Well, I I would have to definitively say yes, it must. So if our, te if our technologies are evolving the way that um, is happening, this is not fiction anymore, this is real, then, then what do we do? What are we left with as human beings? If, if, our, if artificial intelligence is stronger, faster, more powerful, then what are we left with? We have empathy, we have heart, we have emotion, we have, we have intelligence, we have judgment. We can think things through differently. So we have creativity, we invented artificial intelligence. Then aren't we poised at that moment of thinking about designing in ways that solve some of those extraordinarily difficult problems of, of um, fiction, friction and, and, and discontent and war. I mean, this is, this is not so easy. We have potentially war on the brink with North Korea. So I'm painfully aware, but, but surely, all we have in our life, all we have as human beings is hope, and we have our intelligence, and we have succeeded this far. So what are, this is a very unusual time that, that we occupy in our history, in the history of humanity. So what must we do? I don't, we don't, I don't have the answers, I just, I know that in our office, this is what, these are the questions that we think about and then you go back to what you know. You go back to what you're comfortable with and, and you know you have to try. And you try through the creativity that you can muster. Not a, not a great answer, I'm sorry, but, but, but certainly um, we must try and it is possible. Um, I like your view on um, technology 
So uh, we embrace technology, um, we invite it in our lives, but the impact that it also has is privacy and um, uh, that type of aspect because we invite all these things and we put our lives out there. And also we have to store this information that we also want to share. So then we have to have storage farms for all this other information. So that's also an impact on our environment. Yes. We have privacy, but we also have the potential for mass um, abuse with that same privacy. We don't know where Facebook is headed. We don't know what happens in the cloud. We, there, there, there are too many unknowns, and we don't know the consequence of some of this. But, 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 but for all the positives and for all the challenges that go with the, the positives, we also know that there are the huge opportunities to, to think things through, and we also know that we actually have a responsibility to do that. Hi. So when you start a new project, where do you find the most like inspiration? Is it from like the people around there or like other projects that you get inspiration from? No, it's very rare that we look at other projects for inspiration. We, we, um, our process is very driven by the, the question at hand. So we delve um, quite deeply into the meaning of things. Um, so whether it's a brief or words, we look carefully at rethinking things. Um, and we do a lot of research uh, into the context. If it's, a, if it's an academic exercise, then it's, it's an academic contextual thinking. But if it's a physical project, we look at the physical context and we look at every aspect we possibly can. We, we, we try to leave no stone unturned. And, and it takes a lot of time. And so I feel like um, by honing a good process of thorough investigation and then coming up with conclusions that start out being perhaps somewhat rational, but layering in a creativity to those, those um, potential solutions, that you end up with results that are, are in their process really different. They, end project, which is what most people look at. Most, most of us only look at the stylized final thing. Uh, we're a little less interested in that. It would be nice to get there with it being intrinsic to what the entire process was about. We want the honesty of that, the truth of that. And so we feel like we've just been honing all of this and that maybe in the next decade, of our work, we will, we will come up with very different kind of outcomes, physical outcomes. But right now, we've just been honing the process and doing a, a, a very sort of rigorous, in-depth um, review of our own process to arrive at solutions that are both intrinsic to the problem and appropriate as a solution for a long-term, more timeless kind of um, Aesthetic, perhaps? Expression? Uh, you stress the importance of a sort of collective, designing as a collective. Do you think that there's no space for a sort of individual design or for an individual to design? Well, the collective can only happen through a collection of individuals. But at the end of the uh, 
day, I mean, a collective is going to go one way despite what the individual within the collective is fighting for, correct? Yeah, the collective, for, for us, the collective isn't to override an individual, an individual's creativity. The collective is in place to maximize, to optimize the possibilities. So if you have, uh, if I have one set of ideas and I brainstorm with like-minded or actually ideally with non-like-mindedness and we, we really have a meeting of the minds, then the outcome we think is, is perhaps more superior. That doesn't mean that there isn't room for individual genius. We're not, we're not denying that. We just, we, just, um, we just think that there is, uh, there is a need to also address the fact that it takes a village to build anything. And we all love vernacular design. Vernacular design has, is here to stay. We go to environments that they, I saw hammocks out there. Well, however that came about, whoever designed that, we don't know who did it, but it's enjoyed by everyone. And, and so for us, the success of good design is when you've designed something that's become that intuitive and that essential that it becomes, it doesn't matter who did it. And so in that sense, we're not into superstar. We're not, um, we, we, we think that the implications of design are more profound. That's just our point of view. So I'm, I'm not by any means saying that there isn't, everything else is of course really important as well. Um, I just, you know, when I was with the big firms, I was design director at SOM and we had like 120 people in the interiors at that time. And, uh, and there we were, and here, here I was giving direction to different things. And we were, I told Mark this last night, and we were um, telling, now this was like 15 years ago, and we had um, this whole idea of collaboration was just new. And I'm not sure why it had come up. I suspect it really was. We were in our discussions thinking it really was about real estate efficiency and cramming people into smaller space. But we weren't saying that. The rhetoric around it, the story around it, the spin on it was that this is good. This is about, uh, about putting people together and then workplace and allowing people to share more. Well, that's fine. That actually is an interesting thought, and it probably does work. And it actually is true that when you get two minds, you potentially have the, the intellectual capital of 10. That's true. So what, what had struck me at the time was that we were crafting this story, and then we would convince the CEOs and our clients that this was fact. And we were peddling, and I am using words that are not very pleasant, but we peddled these concepts to these companies, companies like Deloitte, they're really intelligent companies, and, and they would they would convince them because we're good salespeople and, and could talk a good talk, and they would they, they'd put in place these projects. But internally, we weren't doing any of that. It was a really backstabbing, awful environment. 400 people, 450 people all striving, some of the best of the best minds, striving, some great creatives, striving for equal attention and wanting to be individualistic. And so that's, for me, where this whole thought of um, needing, as a human being, needing to remain in integrity and walk the talk that works. So I happen to love designing for a lot of people. And, and, and I think shaping, shaping, um, shaping, shaping processes and opinions and affecting human lives um, with projects that really support people is not such an easy thing to do. And so 
I'm not sure that we're still, I'm, st I'm still not convinced that the Deloitte's and all the other major corporations that, that people are all that thrilled to be in those collaborative environments where you have the flexibility of space but you're elbow to elbow sitting at benching. But, but at least what we can do is be a lot more thoughtful and if we can do it in our own practice, then presumably we can, we can replicate that for our clients. So, so maybe I should, have, I should have said that at the beginning. This, what, we're, what we think about, it, it is not, we're not trying to be a boutique. We are a small practice. We're not trying to be a boutique firm. We're not trying to do cool hip work. We're trying to, what we would like to do is meaningful. We don't need to be remembered. We don't need to be liked. But, but we think that if we can make a one small contribution with, uh, for shaping the creative in a way that, that makes an impact in life quality for people, then, then I think my partners and I would all agree that we've done our little bit and we'd be very happy. We have one more. One more question. One more question. One more question. Okay. Uh, hi. I, so, w you made this statement that technology does not have ethics, and I'm letting that sink in. And I'm thinking a lot of people also don't have ethics, and I can think of quite a few kind of in the in the public realm right now. It's kind of a cynical world. Um, is it is it possible that? technology could at some point help us with that. Is that a part of your thinking about, about design? Is there a, a technological solution that could help us <laughs> become, I, more, I'm, I'm, become more ethical? I'm, I'm not sure that I, th I, I don't think I said that technology doesn't have ethics. Um, I know that Garrett um, I, I think what's provocative about what he says is really the unintended consequence of things. And when we're being, when we aspire to be innovative, and innovation, I don't take that word lightly. Innovation to me isn't restyling something. It is, it is something that transforms our lives. That the, the iPhone is, or the cell phone is an innovation. Um, so in that, in that context, I would think that of course there is integrity, of course there is truth, of course there is beauty, um, but, but, but there are aspects we don't know about. So, so the question isn't that, the question isn't about solving things, um, about trying to formulate a set of, uh, ethics or a code of ethics, the question is more for, for, for me, I think, that we know what we know and that's easy. Sometimes we know what we don't know and that's um, also somewhat easy. But then there, there is that very large realm of things that we don't know that we don't know. And in that realm, we do something and I feel like our world is headed there. I feel like we, well, I don't feel like it. That's a, that's a funny way to say that, uh, my apology. Um, evidently, we are all at that brink of a massive transformation because of the technological advancements. That's fact. And so where we are is that we are in that realm of we don't know what we don't know. And if we don't know what it is, all I, all I think that I wanted to say here and some of the questions we have is, well then, in the face of not knowing anything at all, we go back to our basics to say, well, okay, so we're human, let's be honest, let's, let's be ethical, let's be just. And, and then the world that we, that we work in shapes beauty and shapes human behavior and it can uplift the human spirit 
and, and, and we want to improve life quality, so then what is all that? And I, you know, these are, this is all, these are some very big thoughts. This is, these are, this is not an easy, I didn't come here with a, with a sort of some cool hip work to show, I wish I had, it's perhaps an easier talk. Um, but, but I'm sharing with you very honestly questions that we have that I think are really important for the academy to try to address and to address in every single project and to try to, try, to try to get ahead of, because right now our technology is leading us by the nose and it's frightening. I don't know enough about technology to possibly begin thinking about an ethical code for that stuff. I don't even know how to put the sound on and off on this stuff sometimes. Um, but we do know what we do know and so that's kind of, it's knowing what we know to be really grounded firmly in that, be really clear in that, and be confident, and get a sense of empowerment from that, to step into all that we don't know for the sake of our future. Thank you. Boy, they're difficult questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.